Good morning. Am I audible? Yes. You are. Alright. So evidence-based homeopathy, yeah? I'm going to say homeopathy is witchcraft. Do you agree? No. Yes. So prove it. You don't agree, right? No, we do. We do. You do? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people have said homeopathy is witchcraft, a lot of them. And the most recent one being a doctor from the British Medical Association called Tom Dalton. He said homeopathy was witchcraft. And if you want to refute his claims, because we live in a world that goes by numbers, that needs proof, that needs evidence, you can't just go around saying, I treat asthma cases, I treat these cases, I have success. We need some sort of proof, uh, some sort of proof in numbers. Yesterday I had a very interesting discussion with Jerry about the lack of research-oriented papers in homeopathy. Yeah. So this is what my study is going to focus on. So I ask the question, why? Why do we need evidence-based homeopathy? Any opinions? Why we need evidence-based homeopathy? Because at the moment in Australia, sorry, at the moment in Australia and actually in the UK, we have the problem that there is no evidence for homeopathy, and therefore, you know, we may not be allowed to practice it anymore. Exactly. So research is really a, the key to whether we're accepted or whether we're not. Yes, that's one view. Somebody up here, I saw them. Uh, can I repeat the question? Why do we need evidence, evidence did you say? Yes. Okay. So, if, when you say we, who do you mean? I mean the general public who do not yet believe or the opportunity can work the miracle that is working every day. Okay. Well, those kind of people, the ones who don't believe, no amount of evidence or research that we do is going to change their belief. Because if people don't believe that homeopathy works, no amount of evidence, no amount of new evidence will change their belief. For the people who do believe that homeopathy works, no evidence is necessary. Well, that is one opinion, thank you. But I sometimes beg to differ. Wow, that's a kind of so um, one of the things that we really need evidence for is in America, the American Veterinary Medical Association a few years ago said veterinarians may not, we're going to do a resolution saying veterinarians may not use homeopathy in practice. I mean, in all of the US. And it was evidence-based homeopathy that was collected by several veterinary homeopaths that changed the mind of the people who didn't believe about, didn't know about homeopathy. Not necessarily averse, but they didn't know about it. So it's, you may not change somebody who's anti, but you can bring people on board who just don't know. And evidence makes a difference. It made a difference. And I would just like, sorry, I'd like to comment that um, we need evidence research for ourselves. Because when we put our attention onto trying to understand why we see a pattern in our cases, then we get much greater understanding of it. And if we just carry on being successful but not actually necessarily putting our attention on it, then we can't keep growing. And I think that's really important from that perspective. Thank you. Okay, my experience is from Malaysia. Um, our government, uh, about 10 years ago, decided that they want to introduce complementary medicine and they don't, want, they don't like the word alternative. So they want to uh, introduce complementary medicine into the hospital. But they are, quote unquote, the, the thing that they wanted to introduce was only those practices that were evidence-based. And uh, we had some very negative uh, uh, attitudes from the traditional and complementary medicine division within the government. And then in uh, 2011, uh, the Homeopathic Medical Council actually 
uh, it was really blood, sweat and tears. We, drew, uh, we, we collected enough money because the government would not uh, give any funding. They, they say they are co-organizers but they didn't give anything. So we came up with the money and we called in experts from all over the world including Pavel Brasho from uh, Cuba. And uh, of course many of the government officials attended that. And so now the, that division has a very positive attitude towards homeopathy because of the evidence that we brought in and showed to them about homeopathy. So it may not convince those who are, what, what do you call it, yeah. hardcore antagonists to homeopathy. And they do that because of Western interests. Because they are specialists, and you know, if you are a specialist, any specialist, and a plain old ordinary, no specialist homeopath would be able to cure your diseases, you're not going to be happy about it, right? Uh -huh. But then the core people, the policy makers, are now softened and accepting of uh, introducing homeopathy into the government. And we've made a lot of progress uh, in, in this direction. Can I just intersperse here? <clears throat> it seems that this is a hot topic that everyone's got lots of uh, <laughs> contributions to make, but we want to allow time for Dr. Coutinho's talk. So perhaps we could um, put a melting pot topic, the benefits of um, showing research and homeopathy, and we can, we've got two melting pot sessions where we can fully discuss that, and I'm sure it's a topic that's going to be relevant to every one of us. So um, if you've got any other questions that um, uh, relating to Dr. Um, Coutinho's talk, um, would you take questions at the end? Or? Yes, sure, at this yeah. time I would take them yeah. now or later whenever. Okay, all right. Thank you, Marina. All right, a lot of opinions from all over the world about research and evidence-based homeopathy, so we definitely know why we need it. And the doctor who's talking about Tom Dalton, yeah, who said homeopathy is witchcraft, he made a public apology and said, I'm sorry, it's not witchcraft. It's nonsense on stilts. <laughs> That's what he said. So we have very controversial views, both sides of the spectrum. Where do we find balance? I believe balance will be found in research. Research that honors the profession of homeopathy about it being individualistic and not just randomized, double-blind control studies because those don't work in the setting of homeopathy. So I'd like my presentation to go along the lines of an author called Scarlett... Can I have an next slide, please? Scarlett Thomas, who in her book said homeopathy seemed both mathematical and poetic. I think this is the right balance because homeopathy is both an art and a science. And we have to give enough of attention to both aspects. All right, big number, 334 million. This is the size of <coughs> the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia put together. Big population. Do those numbers mean anything? We can't compute them. So take, for example, a big football field. Fill it with people. That's a lot of people, right? Multiply that by 6,000. That's the number of worldwide asthma sufferers. That's the number of people we have suffering from bronchial asthma. Any sufferers in the room? There. Used to. But I don't anymore because I use homeopathy. Thank you. <laughs> But we've definitely seen patients with bronchial asthma, yeah? Our son, the was cured by homeopathy. Right. All right, so why did I look at asthma? Because I needed a database that was large. And according to recent statistics, the number of asthma sufferers is increasing every 10 decades by 50%. That's a large number, right? 50% every 10 years. And the WHO estimates that by 2020, bronchial asthma and COPDs will be the third leading cause of death. The first two being heart and brain disease. Yeah? So I went to this large group of asthma sufferers and decided to formulate a study. I donned the hat of principal investigator. I set out with my little tune kits, which I will explain shortly. This is something we can all replicate in our clinics because I believe we have a lot of access to raw data that we treat every day successfully or unsuccessfully. 
but we do not document these cases, which is from where we get we can get all our research. We don't need elaborate institutes funding us always. We don't need a huge team. Just need a little bit of organization. <coughs> so I set out as principal investigator with these little tools. I have an answer. And we formulated the study, Utility of Culinary Function Tests for Evidence-Based Homeopathy in Bronchial Asthma. Quite a mouthful. So let's break them down. Yeah? We talk about asthma according to medicine. I don't think I need to go into a lot of detail because this is a condition we are familiar with. It's basically hyper-responsiveness of the tracheobronchial tree. So the person has bronchoconstriction of their air tubules, they have trouble breathing, they have wheezing, they have a cough, they have mucus saturation, and number of symptoms. Over a period of time, this goes on to cause smooth muscle relaxation, bronchoconstriction. If you look here, relax smooth muscles in a non-asthmatic airway. Once the person gets asthmatic over a period of time, they develop tightened smooth muscles, trapped air in the alveoli, and so on and so forth. A lot of pathological changes also can occur. What does homeopathy say about asthma? John gave us a very different view about chronic diseases. Do you agree it's a chronic or an acute disease? Chronic. Sorry? Chronic. chronic, yeah. Chronic. According to Hanuman and the organ, what kind of chronic disease? to brush up your organ a little bit. I agree I was at school later than you, so <laughs> an undue advantage. And so he classifies them as natural chronic diseases, yeah? which come up and go on irrespective of how good you are with your diet and regimen and all of it. It's just in you. It's an inborn disease potential, which we are so fond of calling myosins. Yeah. So an Indian homeopath called Prafal Vijayka, if you've heard of him, Yes. He gives a very interesting view to the disease theory in homeopathy. And what he uses is a aphorism number 76. 76? Sorry, 74. Let me read for you. Because I find going back to basic books very, very enlightening. So what it says is, that the body responds to any disease potential in three different ways. It must either deprive some part of its irritability and sensibility, which we know to be sora, or exalt these to an excessive degree, a psychotic manifestation, cause dilatation or contraction, relaxation or induration, which is also psychotic, or even total destruction of certain parts, a syphilitic manifestation. Are you on the same page as me, or is this too much? Let me read it again, yeah? So it says, an organism must either deprive some part of its irritability and sensibility, or exalt these to an excessive degree, sora, cause dilatation or contraction, relaxation or induration, psychosis, and finally, even total destruction of parts, syphilitic mazid. Yeah? So working on these principles, asthma would fall into the category of sora at the beginning, and finally psychosis. And maybe eventually in some very susceptible cases they go on to a syphilitic expression. All right, so this is what asthma as a disease is like from the homeopathic standpoint. But as we know, Hanuman never spoke of a disease with its name, right? It was either Nicola with asthma, yes. or Naima with asthma, or somebody else with asthma. The name of the disease is not important, right? So what did I do? I figured out a way to use very simple parameters by which I could measure changes in a person, in an individual with asthma, before and after homeopathic treatment. Anybody familiar with these instruments? No. All right, so we start with the first one. That's right speed flow meter, which is a very simple device. 
into which you ask the person to inhale very deeply and then exhale as forcefully as they can. Because what happens in a patient who is asthmatic is they have bronchoconstriction and consequently airflow limitation. So they can't exhale as forcefully as normal people can. This is a very simple parameter you can use in your clinic. Your patient can use at home. For a lady, the parameters differ a little bit from race to race. A normal lady should be able to expire or exhale between 400 to 600 milliliters of air per minute, yeah, or per breath. So the minute you have this value reducing, you know your patient is in trouble. Now let's say you give them a homeopathic medicine and you test this value again and it improves. You have proof, right? So this is a very, very simple instrument that you can give to your patients, you can use in your clinic. The next one is a visual analog scale, which was originally designed for pain. Some of you might be familiar with this one. Anyone? So what you're doing is you're quantifying pain from the patient's perspective. So you show the patient the scale which has five faces with different expressions and they tell you how good or bad they are feeling by moving the little blue indicator to a particular face. Let's say they move it to where it is right now. This means they have no pain at all. If they move it to the last one, that's the highest degree of pain. And if you turn the scale over, you have a marking from 0 to 100, which corresponds to these faces. Now, why pain and asthma? It's not relevant, yeah? So in asthma, one of the most relevant symptoms is shortness of breath. So that's what I used this visual analog scale for, shortness of breath. Because I might measure with my fancy instruments that you have 300 milliliters of air coming out with each breath the first time and then you have 600, I'm happy. But the patient may not be happy because subjectively they are not better. And as we know from Kent's observations, you cannot base the outcome of any case solely on physical parameters. What also matters is the general symptoms of the patient, how good or bad are they feeling. Because as John mentioned earlier, if your blood reports or any physical parameters are getting better, but the patient is subjectively worse, you know you're doing something very, very wrong. Any experiences on that front? Sure, all of us. <laughs> right, so I've had asthma cases come in sometimes, and we treat them and the asthma gets better, and then they come up with another very serious problem. We see that a lot in skin cases. Yeah? The skin clears out and then they are wheezing. So to a homeopath who's not observant enough, you think you're doing well in that case, but you're not. Because you're pushing the disease deeper. And according to Prafal Vijaykar and a lot of other Indian homeopaths who use embryology as their basis to understanding disease, the skin is part of the ectoderm. Right? Then you have the mesoderm and the endoderm three layers from which we all come. The skin arises from the outermost, that's the ectoderm, and all the respiratory epithelium arises from the endoderm. So any skin manifestation that you push deeper very easily goes on to the endoderm, that's the inner layer. So this is one very important point to keep in mind when you're practicing and you're assessing the outcome of your patients. If you're clearing relatively superficial symptoms and these symptoms appear to be going deeper, you are in trouble. In a lot of cases, my visual analog scale helped me realize that I was happy with the results of the patients blowing in and out of this little tube, but they were not. They were subjectively not feeling better. And that's how I knew I had to change my approach of treatment or change what I was doing or change the potency Look at the case from a dis different perspective. The last one that I have there is called a microplus spirometer, similar to the first one by principle, but the values it measures are different. I will explain what values these are. But what you need to understand is in a study like this, it's difficult to use this with children because they don't understand. Breathe in fully, 
Make a tight seal around the tube with your mouth and then exhale as forcefully as you can. You can't get an eight-year-old to do this. Which is why my study included adults from the age of 20 to 40 years only. Because by doing this, I also ruled out cases of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which although similar to asthma <laughs> in pathology and pre presentation, has a very different underlying symptom wherein both have airflow limitation. But in asthma, it is reversible. In COPD, it is irreversible. There are very advanced pathological changes that take place. And since my, mine was a short-term study, where I did a baseline testing at zero weeks and then at two weeks, I did not want very complicated cases of COPD coming in and clouding my study. Because when you're doing something research-oriented, the less you have, the more it is. Yeah? Less is always better. So I excluded cases that were under 20, over 40. I excluded cases that had recent history of upper abdominal surgery because then you can't breathe out and exhale very forcefully. Don't worry about all this information, it's on the handout in your file. The whole study has been summarized for you. I have the next one. These are the six parameters I used. So forced expiratory volume in the first second. So you ask the patient to breathe in. That's the first second. So you measure how much of air the person breathes out in the first second. Then I measured force vital capacity, which is the total amount of air they can breathe out after a deep inspiration. <coughs> then I had a ratio. I had from the right speed flow meter something called peak expiratory flow rate. I had from the scale, visual analog scale, which quantified the patient's breathlessness for me from their perspective, not mine. And then I did something called a six-minute walk test, which I will explain. So this is what the graph looks like when you ask your patient to breathe in and out. So what you see first is the person during quiet respiration, breathing out and in normally as all of you are. Then you ask them to take a deep breath in and expire as forcefully and for as long as they can. In the first second, what it measures is forced expiratory volume 1. That's in the first second. It is humanly possible to expire for up to 6 seconds. I see some of you trying it. <laughs> These are the two values that we use. Forced expiratory volume 1 and forced viral capacity. And a ratio of the two. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritties of why and how because we are on this over this session. But let's go and see what happened. Sorry. This is what the visual analog scale looks like from the front and from the back. This particular scale has a marking of only up to 10. Mine wasn't available, so it would give you a picture of that one. But what we did is we quantified how the patient was feeling. So maybe the first time they came and said 75. The next time they came, it was 25. We knew they were subjectively better even if their spirometric tests were worse. Have you had cases like that? Parameters mm -hmm. yeah. yes. getting worse, but the patient subjectively better. Yes. Yes. Another one of Kent's observations. Next one, please. All right, for the six minute walk test, this is something very new in asthma research and homeopathy, because till date, whatever studies I've researched have never used this parameter in asthma studies. So what you do is you get a length of 60 meters, you measure pulse, blood pressure, and the rate, or you use, a, you use a scale to quantify breathlessness, and then you ask the patient to walk along those 60 meters for six minutes, and see how much distance they can cover. They're not allowed to run, they have to walk. And after they do that, you repeat the same parameters again. So pulse, blood pressure, and you use a scale to quantify how breathless they are. So what I was essentially testing is the value of homeopathy in exercise-induced asthma. Some cases get their symptoms only when they're running uphill. In kids, you see that a lot. And break time, and they're wheezing. If they're in class, they're fine. So in this study, no other study till date has incorporated this element 
which I felt was important to use. So I had six parameters for each case. And as you can imagine, I had a lot of dropouts. Because a lot of people were not happy about walking 60 meters in a crowded OPD in India and have everybody stare at them and see what they're doing. They were not happy. So I did manage to get 30 cases, which is the minimum you need for a study to be statistically significant. I had those 30 cases. This is the kind of distribution of the cases I had. I classify them into acute exacerbation and chronic stable asthma. So each category had four subcategories, which I've divided. And what we saw at the end of the study, that's post two weeks, I did not want to take a longer study because everybody says, myopathy is slow, we need to wait for years and years and years. And I wanted to prove that in two weeks, we can show results that are good enough. So what we saw at the end of these two weeks is a lot of the cases moved up. So at the end of it, we had a lot of people in the mild category for acute exacerbation. Of course, some of them responded way earlier than two weeks. That again was a drawback of the study. You can't always get patients to come back to you in three days or two days because they take two buses to come to you or they walk kilometers on end to get there. So two weeks seemed like a reasonable amount of time. Next one, please. How oh, are we? love numbers, don't we? We don't? How oh, are So there was this guy in a hot air balloon who flew over a place, and he saw another guy on the ground and he said, hey, can you tell me where I am? He says, yeah, sure. You have arrived in at a speed of 58 kilometers per hour. You're at a hovering speed right now, 12 feet above the ground. You're 12 degrees north and 8 minutes, 42 degrees south and 35 degrees east. So the guy in the hallway room says, wow, thank you. Are you a statistician by any chance? And he says, yes, how did you know? He says, well, because all the details you've given me are very accurate but they help me in no way at all. <laughs> the guy on the ground says, hmm, you're right, but are you a principal investigator by any chance? <laughs> and he says, yes, how did you know? He says, because you got here by blowing hot air. <laughs> you started asking questions after you got into trouble. You're at exactly the same spot when you arrived, but now somehow it's my fault. <laughs> So yeah, I'm the principal investigator in this case. <laughs> and these are a lot of numbers that are going to drive you crazy. So what I'm going to do is I'm only going to focus on the last one that's called the p-value. This is what I did with all my six parameters before and after my study with the help of a statistician, of course, not by myself. <coughs> and it's the p-value that's important in understanding research studies. I'm sure some of you are already familiar with the p-value. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is demystify the p-value. Any study, any research study, always has a, a hypothesis. So my hypothesis was there will be pulmonary function test changes after homeopathic treatment. Right? Are you with me? You can stop me and ask me to repeat if it doesn't make sense. So this is the hypothesis. Every hypothesis has to have a null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis would be there is no change after homeopathic treatment. Okay, the probability of the null hypothesis being true is called p-value. Fair enough? Okay. So if the p-value is 1, don't worry about how you get there. The statistician does that. If the p-value is 1, it means that the null hypothesis is true. All right? If the p-value is 0 0.5, it means you have a 50% chance of the null <coughs> hypothesis being true. So the study is not really got a good outcome. It could be true, it could not be true. If you have a p-value that's less than 0 0.5, the higher your chances of having a false null hypothesis. Confusing? 
very confusing for some. For me, it was. All right, so let me put it in a very simple way. If the p-value is less than 0 0.5, it's still useful. Yeah. Fair enough? Yes. Easy enough? So in a statistical study, if you're reading a research paper, look for the p-value. Also look at the methodology they've used. But if you have a p-value less than 0 0.5, you know that particular study is statistically significant. All right? So this is the value we're going to look at for all of my parameters. I'm not going to burden you with the rest of them because they're a lot. So we have six parameters, and these are the p-values for all of them. The 0 0.00 does not mean zero. There is a significant decimal somewhere out there in the distance, but it was too far, so it wasn't put. But this essentially means that all the parameters were statistically very, very significant. All right, now, I'm not here to blow my own trumpet and say, yay, I had success in 30 cases of asthma. There were difficulties which I will discuss. But statistically speaking, this study had a very, very good outcome. Because any p-value of 0 0.05 and less tells you that the null hypothesis has a very, very low chance of being true. Confused? No. So to make it less confusing, I put these values into percentage, which is way easier to understand. So the darker orange indicates improved cases. And as you can see in all of the parameters again, we have very high percentages of improvement. Especially in the six minute walk test, 100%. What this implies, again, we will discuss shortly. So we're done with the mathematical part of the study, which for me was the most daunting part to put across. Because I know how much everybody loves numbers. I'm not a fan. But when you're in research, you need to work with numbers. So let's move on to the poetic part of the study, which is a prescription, administration, selection of remedies. And before we go on, let me give you a setting in which the study was done. It was done at a medical college in India that has a faculty of about 30 different teachers. Each one has their own OPD time. So as you can imagine, different styles of prescribing. I did not prescribe for all the cases. I was just the principal investigator. Yeah, up there, blowing hot air. So as you can make out, the styles of prescription are very different. They differ from person to person, but we did not want to interfere with that. We did not want to give one single remedy to all asthma patients, see what the outcome was, because that defeats the very purpose of homeopathy, which is being individualization. Okay? So very different styles of prescription. I ask you to look at it with the minimum amount of prejudice. Okay? This is what it looked like at the end. 33% of the population the 30 people strong population, received more than one remedy. That happens to us as well, right? We're not sure of the similimum, or we feel a tissue salt needs to be added for supplementation, or we go the tincture way. Majority received a single remedy, 67%. And if you look at these remedies, not all of them strike you as predominantly asthma remedies, right? Calicarb, yes, because it is in its pathology. We were discussing the 3 a.m. modality the other day. If you go back to medicine books, it mentions very clearly that an asthma sufferer will have an aggravation at 3 a.m. So if you look at it from the homeopathic standpoint, that's not a characteristic symptom, it's a common symptom. <coughs> but it still works. Why does, it, why does a common symptom still work? Why does prescription on a common symptom still work? Because we've been taught, use characteristics, use peculiar symptoms, use queer symptoms. Any ideas? Why prescription on a common symptom works? Yes, one, one reason is because it is elevated 
to a general symptom, all their symptoms are more sexually young, or the intensity of the symptom is such that it demands to be called a characteristic symptom. It's very, very peculiar in its intensity, not in being a symptom per se. Yes, so we had Calicom, we had Pulsatilla, we had Nathamsalf, Naxvomica, Rustox. These are remedies we're familiar with using very regularly. We had one very particular case with cactus. Cactus grandifolia, which you don't think of in respiratory complaints or in a case of asthma. And that was given to her because she described cactus exactly as it is from the books. She was clutching her chest and saying that there was something around her heart. She had asthma, but she was talking about her heart. One dose of that cleared up the case. We also had cases that didn't respond to anything. We had a lady who was around 37 years old, shrieking with the asthma. Nothing would help her. She was rolling on the ground in distress. She had a little bit of a psychiatric problem as well, so it was very dif difficult to differentiate her symptoms, which of them came out of the asthma and which of them came out of the psychiatric condition. Because at one point she was climbing windows and we admitted this patient because she was so difficult to treat. We had success with her, but in a different way, because no remedy that we thought was a similar one helped her. I will tell you about it in a bit. May I have the next one, please? All right, so drug administration, as mentioned in aphorism number 284, let me read for you. Any cues? Anyone? Sorry? All right, so I read for you. Besides the tongue, mouth, and stomach, which are most commonly affected by the administration of medicine, the nose and respiratory organs are receptive of the action of medicine in fluid form by means of olfaction and inhalation through the mouth. These were asthma cases, not responding to anything. We nebulized them with homeopathic tincture. And that gave us success in this case of the lady rolling on the floor and climbing windows and driving us nuts. In tincture? In tincture. In tincture form, a few drops into the nebulizer. Make the patient inhale that. If the tincture is indicated again, if it's not indicated, it's not going to work. We had cases where it didn't work. But in two cases out of these 30, one was Brindelia and one was Blatter. They work brilliantly. In this lady, I think it was bladder. Because arsenic alb was her remedy. And it's mentioned clearly when arsenic alb fails in asthma cases, you give bladder. You're familiar with bladder? Yeah. Our friend, the conclusion. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. To clarify, teacher, are we talking mother teacher? Mother teacher. Just a few drops, it was an experiment. It worked, we found a reference in organin to support what we were doing. So we nebulized three patients in total, one with Grindelia, two with Blatter. Two responded, one did not have favorable response. She responded to a similar one that we gave her later. Do you have any understanding of why the nebulizer worked for that person? As I like to see it, probably some people are more sensitive to a different route of administration rather than just taking the remedy orally. Yeah, as we were talking about our GIT being rife with a lot of bacteria, a lot of toxins, possibly inhaling this had a different effect. As um, Christina was mentioning the other day, rub medicine onto the ear of a horse. The skin is also a very good medium for administering the remedy. But this was an eye-opener to us because we often get patients coming and saying, I have asthma and all you're giving me are these tiny little white sugar balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What sort of a doctor are you? <laughs> <laughs> so then you say, okay, get a fancy nebulizing machine, put in a few drops, inhale a little bit, they're happy. Yes. So why did you give it in water to sit? We did think of that, but since this was an asthma case, we felt this mode of administration would be faster, and it was. 
Because in a lot of cases that we'd see in previous to the study, drops were given in water, but the effect was faster when they inhaled it. And I've seen that subsequently in practice as well. When I can nebulize the patient with the tincture that is indicated, not just any tincture, they respond faster. What about lobelia, which is, uh, was recommended for Yeah, lobelia we did not use in this particular study. And I've seen it used in cardiac asthma, which is not exactly asthma. It is left ventricular failure problems, which then leads to respiratory trouble. So lobelia, in my experience so far, has been given in predominantly cardiac cases that have uh, breathlessness problems. Any other experiences of, has anybody nebulized with a tincture before? I'm no. curious. Not actually a tincture, I had one of my mums, one of my mums actually put the remedy in the nebulizer and told me it worked absolutely amazingly. So I haven't done it myself, but I've seen my patients do it for a few years. That's nice. We used rescue remedy when we couldn't uh, help our child as a baby. Mm -hmm. So we find what he needed, and we found that once we did that, he would immediately get better. That's nice. I've seen some of you with um, sprays as well. Was it Jane? Yes. Yeah. So inhalation is another route of administration that I think we can strongly consider. And possibly in respiratory illnesses, it has more of an effect because that organ is already susceptible. Now, a lot of homeopaths in India are against external application. Like they, they say very staunchly that if you have a wart, do not give any cream, do not give any application. But if you go back to organin, again, there are very contradictory views from Hanuman. So I choose to read H.J. Roberts for this particular view on local application, where he mentions that the remedy given internally and used externally at the same time over unbroken skin has a very, very beneficial effect, not over the lesion per se. Can I just mention something here? I'd just like to mention something that the product H guys, which is mainly for inflammation and swelling. Um, when I had somebody in my clinic who had been bitten by a tick, and they had terrific cellulitis, they had an arm that was three times its size. I actually gave them the two remedies in H goes to take orally, plus H goes to take used topically, and that cellulitis had gone within three days. Yes, I've had similar experiences of using calendula in a wound. Somebody who's had an accident, calendula externally and calendula 30C internally also produces really good results. But this particular method of drug administration through nebulization was an eye opener to my colleagues and I that this is a route that needs more attention. I don't think it has enough because we're always using drugs orally. And that might not be the best bet because we're shoving everything else under the sun into our mouths. Maybe we need to consider other routes of administration as well. Um, I know there's a case that's often taught, and I'm not sure who to attribute it to, Robin Murphy or Andre Singh, of a woman who was very sensitive, very, very sensitive, environmentally sensitive, and they started by not even nebulizing, but just opening the vial out in the hallway. And then she had a three-day aggravation on oxygen and then moved it in, and the final cure was olfaction. So, good point Thank to do that. So, in conclusion, can we press again, please? You'll have to keep, yeah, just get the whole spine. All right, so all six parameters showed significant improvement, which we saw between 80 to 100 percent. Acute cases naturally showed faster and better improvement than chronic cases, which I always use to counter arguments that homeopathy is slow, which it isn't. It is case specific. You can't say it is slow or fast for that matter. It depends on the case and the person that you're dealing with and the physician. 
Admitted cases were much better monitored. In the college that we conducted the study, we had facilities to admit patients, so we were there around the clock. If they needed supplemental oxygen, we could give them that, which is not something you can do if you have patients coming to you on an outpatient basis. They come to you and then you see them again after two weeks, it doesn't work. So in severe cases of asthma, the ones that we admitted, they had very favorable outcomes. And what was nice for us is that we could keep tabs on them all hours of the clock. Because most times, more than the wheezing and the asthma, it's the panic that you have to deal with. And with children who are not part of the study, but I do get them in my clinic, it's the parents you have to deal with. <laughs> And the parent comes in with a child that's wheezing and blue, and you tell the parent, you need a remedy, they think you're good. <laughs> but they do, because they're freaking out, and then the child absorbs that panic and that fear from them. So as I've noticed in practice, you get a child, you get some improvements with them, you get the whole family. And nothing could be better, because then you see Madeira America coming alive. You see a pulsatile mom and a like body and father. And they make an excellent pair. Or you see a whole Carbonica family. The babies, the parents, the grandparents. And the pets. And the pets, yes, <laughs> thank you. And the pets. They say you look like your pet, and your pet looks like you. I think it's true. Next one. Well, I have a German Shepherd. Do I look like a German Shepherd? <laughs> Next one. All right, so majority of our patients received a single remedy and did well. The six minute walk distance improved in all cases. And by improved, I mean they could walk more than 100 meters than what they did the first time. Which clearly indicates that homeopathy has a role to play in exercise induced asthma. Which again is another area that needs to be looked into. So this was my study in a nutshell. If you have any questions about it, I'd be happy to answer. published by the university I go to. They have publishing rights, so I need to get them back. <laughs> um, just expanding on the nebulizer, I mean, is there remedies have you ever tried them in potencies other than mother teaching? No, not in this study. patients who come to homeopathy at the beginning, which is excellent, and then we get those who follow teeth. Familiar with teeth? Try everything else, try homeopathy. And those are the ones that are difficult to deal with, because they are on steroids which you cannot withdraw, both for the sake of the patient and ethically speaking, because in India they're just waiting to pounce on you, as it is everywhere in the world, I believe. So it is unethical for me as a homeopathy practitioner to reduce the medication given by another doctor. So what I do is I prescribe my medication to the patient. Once they improve, I tell them, go back to the doctor you came from and ask him whether you need the same dosage. And in 80% of the cases, the doctors have been kind enough to reduce and sometimes stop their medication. So it is a challenge. What I found more challenging when the children are the parents because they panic more than the rest. And what I would have liked to add, which I hope can be added in a study that's done later, a similar study, is a quality of life questionnaire for asthma. Because then again, you're subjectively quantifying how good or bad the life of an asthmatic is. 
which I couldn't incorporate in this study because I already had six parameters. They were frankly getting a little annoyed with me. My statistician was not happy because I had so many parameters for her to deal with. But if a quality of life questionnaire for asthma could be included, I think it would be fabulous. Uh, one question. A question from Melanie, um, who mentioned that one of her mothers put the Pope card uh, really. I wonder if Melanie could help us out. Yes. Yes, Gordon. Was it your mother? No, it was one of my parents. Yeah, one of my parents in Georgia. And I think, I, as from memory, I think it was Arsenica in 30C for a child having an acute attack. And she'd been using homeopathy quite a while, so we were doing constitutional treatment. And it was in the early days when the child was still having the occasional acutes. And she just decided she'd put in the nebulizer and reported that it actually worked better than giving it orally. So more than that, I don't have to report, but that's kind of how it worked. I have one comment and one question. <clears throat> the comment was, in terms of local application, I had a patient with a, a cavity in her finger from a white spider bite, mm -hmm. and I treated her with all the oral homeopathics, <coughs> and spontaneously she <coughs> in the cavity in her finger and it cleared up like incredibly quickly so that was her not me <laughs> uh, so that was a valuable sure we had if i might add here we dispense medicines in india in powder form as well so in little pieces of butter paper a teaspoon of satlak and a drop of the indicated medicine and oftentimes we have patients who do not understand the instructions we had a patient of eczema who came back the next week extremely happy. He said, can I have more of the stuff for my skin to put on? And we didn't give you any. <laughs> no, but I, you did, you gave me the powders. So she didn't take the powder orally at all. She yeah. kept putting it on her skin and it helped. Yeah, yeah. amazing. And the, the question is, um, in terms of the allergic component of asthma, um, I've, I've had lovely results with just giving the constitutional remedy, very nice. Um, but oftentimes um, we do some immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin A testing. And if the child is highly allergic, by removing a, a number of foods or sometimes just one or two specific foods, that can make a huge difference. Um, um, high salicylate foods can make a huge difference. Can you comment on your experience with that? Right. So first off, I'd like to mention why we didn't include IgE testing in this particular study, simply because of the expense. Patients in India can't afford the, the center that I was at. It was almost a free center, and they paid just a nominal amount for their fee registration, and anything over and above that, they would drop out. So all the spirometric testing, all of it was done by me and a few other colleagues who helped out. So an IgE testing was not applicable in the study. But Naima, to answer your question, I do have a lot of asthmatic cases at my clinic who I send for an IgE testing and who come back with way reduced levels. And those are cases of allergic asthmas. You do have other asthmas like exercise and use that don't need it. So it's case specific. If I see an allergic component in a case, I definitely ask them to go and get a blood report done. Yes. Uh, about administering uh, homeopathy, we had Robert Bridge uh, visiting us, and uh, uh, his, one of his cases was in an intensive care and uh, coma tours, etc. And the way he administered uh, was uh, on the wrist once a day and recovery was incredible. So. Yes, thank you. There have been studies, I think, done in Cuba, if I'm not mistaken, with septicemic cases and pyrogen. It was done as a double blind control study, where pyrogen was given based on the levels of septicemia and the blood of patients who were admitted there. And it was just given randomly, and they found incredible results with those who received pyrogen as compared to those who received placebo. Um, I guess my question 
is based on my experience, but uh, so I'm interested to know what your thoughts about it are. Um, do you feel that the drugs themselves become an obstacle to cure? And have you made homeopathic medicines um, out of those and given them at the same time when you're on the drugs? Yes, we have considered that approach of treatment. I think it's called autopathy. Yeah. So personally, I haven't used any remedies on that front, but I have witnessed other practitioners who've done the same. And I intend to witness. Yeah, I've, I've done it with um, quite a lot of patients that are on steroids of one sort or another. We can't take them off the steroids. And what I've noticed is that your ability to handle the steroids is much better. And eventually they just, through their own will, say, go to the doctor and say, I don't want this anymore. And then they can continue taking it, um, the steroid, in the potency for a while. And then they just discard it completely. That's very interesting to know, and I will use this in practice and get back to all of you. Can I just ask, is it just as ethical for a doctor to tell a patient not to take the homeopathic remedy as it is for the homeopath to tell the patient not to take I believe it is, but okay, uh, this question is, is it just as ethical or unethical for another practitioner to tell a patient not to take a homeopathic remedy as it is for the reverse. I believe it is, but I also believe we don't have the legislation in place to prevent it. Because in India, we have a lot of homeopaths trying to practice allopathy for whatever reasons. And we have a lot of allopaths who practice homeopathy, but there is no rule against that. But the reverse is always true. They're trying to prevent homeopaths from practicing systems of medicine that they are not qualified to, which I totally agree with. But the reverse, I'm sorry, is, is not true. Okay, thank you very thank much. You.